Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich, and I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Library, the DeKalb Library Foundation, and Poetry Atlanta Incorporated, welcome to another in our continuing series of virtual events. Once again, we come to you live this evening to present Poetry Atlanta. This is a wonderful program that we started several years ago with Colin Kelly and has continued even through this pandemic. And tonight we will feature some remarkable poets, including Andrea Jurevich, Tiana Nobile, and Aruni Kasha. We also have a special guest host this evening as well, Amy Pence, who will be guiding us through this series of readings tonight. If you'd like to order any of these books, we are happy to say these are all on small independent presses and we will put the links to order each book over in the chat section. I would also like to remind you that if you'd like to ask any questions after we finish the presentation of the poets, please feel free to type those questions into the Q&A feature. You can find that located at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device. Right now, I'd like to introduce our guest this evening. Amy Pence authored five poetry collections, including Amore Amore and The Decadent Lovely and the chapbook Skin Dark Night and Your Posthumous Dress, Remnants from the Alexander McQueen Collection, as well as her hybrid book on Emily Dickinson, Incandescent, winner of the Islands Poetry Award in Athens, Greece. She has also published short fiction interviews, reviews, and essays in a variety of magazines, including Western Humanities Review, Women's Studies Quarterly, The Writer's Chronicle, and Poets and Writers. She's a full-time humanities tutor at Pace Academy and teaches poetry at Emory University and other workshop settings. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. Sit back and enjoy these wonderful poets. And right now I'll turn it over to Amy. Thank you, Joe. Um, I just wanna say it's my pleasure to introduce these amazing poets and writers tonight. I think you're going to have a wonderful uh, reading. Um, and thanks, uh, it's wonderful to fill in for Colin during this time. So our first poet, I'm going to introduce each poet one at a time. Um, so I'm going to start with Andrea. So Andrea Jurovich is a poet, literary translator and educator. She grew up in Rijeka, Croatia, which I had the good fortune to visit this summer in the former Yugoslavia before immigrating to the United States. Her debut poetry collection, Small Crimes, won the 2017 Philip Levine Prize, and her chapbook, Night Call, was just selected for the Acme Poem Company Surrealist Poetry Series and has just been released by Willow Springs Press. Of these poems, Gerard Avant has said, the level of sensuality in this, these poems is alive, dark, toyed with, and is pressed into the mind like beauteous stain. Her book length translations from Croatian include Mama Safari, which was published in 2018, and Dead Letter Office in 2020. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in The Believer, Triquarterly, The Missouri Review, Gulf Coast, and The Southeast Review, among many others. She was a recipient of a Robinson Jeffers, Jeffers Tor Prize, a Tennessee Williams Scholarship from the Sewanee Writers Conference, uh, Hambage Fellowship and the 2018 Georgia Author of the Year Award. Andrea lives in Atlanta, Georgia and teaches at Georgia State University. So I'm so excited to hear um, Andrea read. Here's her book. I hope everybody will get a copy themselves. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Georgia Center for the book for the invitation. Thank you to Ali and to Joe for inviting me and for uh, keeping these readings going and everything you do for the literary community. And a big thank you to Amy Pence, uh, who is herself a phenomenal writer and you should be buying her books. Um, so before I uh, start reading from Night Call, I would like to um, open the reading with a translation. And by the way, um, about um, two months from now, September 30th is International Translation Day. So for once I'm ahead of the schedule. Um, this is from the book Dead Letter Office, um, which is a translation from the Croatian poet uh, Marko Pogacar that came out last summer. And I'm gonna be reading um, a poem called Wild Palms. There is a word in this poem 
that uh, uh, you might not know because I'm not sure how to pronounce it correctly. I have tried to learn today. It's Arist, or the way I would pronounce it is Aorist. A-O-R-I-S-T. It's a, it's a tense, past tense, that um, is typically found in languages that have inflection, inflected languages like Sanskrit and Greek, I think. Croatian has it. So that's that. Wild palms. Loving, that is easiest. Everything else is tough. Much time has passed. Days have begun to cramp. Shopkeepers are cloaked in coats, priests in lies. The night crowd is mangling the only live light bulb down in the south end. What else do I notice? The songs are becoming shorter and your eyes enter them as if entering stadiums carrying flares. Wild palms lurk inside pockets, waiting for their turn. They squat like slavs in tracksuits in front of supermarkets while the North plots a revenge. And silver counters shut with a bang. The still life of a space, the pressure of blood. As for the rest, breakfast goes to a cat, heiress to a verb, gods to the poor, a cold country. And uh, now I'll switch to Night Call, which uh, came out just a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, the first poem that I will uh, read is called Nocturne. This was what this piece is entirely based on a dream. And the entire um, collection, the poems sort of dip in and out of the dream world. And sometimes it's hard to tell when that line sort of is uh, crossed. Nocturne. I walk, watch the sky hang above walls, another night like a vinyl raincoat over the city. On an empty side street, a kebab stand flickers like a tired lighthouse, but there is no sea, just pavement and footsteps unlike the hammer of waves. A woman hobbles over, asks the night cook for a smoke. She is shit-faced and so is he. Their English sounds shredded and I fall in love with them. She pulls up her white dress, climbs on the counter and starts washing her snatch in the sink, gracious like a small animal. From here, it looks as if he drinks that water instead of the woman what washes off her. And maybe the absence of the moon or of the bombs or the cold, the sudden religious cold is messing with this picture, but I dig their tenderness. How gently he stoops to offer simple lapping and in the background, the grease sputtering like a prophet with a speech impediment. Um, I've got a funny little story about the following poem. The first line of this poem it goes like this. It says, your uterus rots at the hospital dump. And by the way, Amy was, um, I gave Amy an early draft of this collection just to see what she thought of it. And she said, you know, you may, I was going to open the collection with this poem. And she said to me like, uh, maybe you don't want to start a collection with a rotten uterus. So I kind of buried the, the poem in the middle of the book. Uh, the poem is titled This Post-Socialist Palimpsest of Your Body. And um, in case somebody doesn't know, palimpsests are basically when you have a material on which there was a text written, and then there is another text written on top of it. Um, so kind of like layering of, of writing. The Post-Socialist Palimpsest of Your Body. Your uterus rots at a hospital dump. The keys on the dresser spread like legs. The boots by the bed are a ghost town. You wear this rental house, the government of its bones, like a good foreigner. And not just because it is July in the South, because all is dust and fevered crickets, you feel sifted. Love is a scratched out ticket. A ship the dock awaits, a flock of gulls settling down in their dirty wedding gowns. 
a mouse shrunk into a bloated blueberry as the morning doubled over and thirsty enters the kitchen that stateless space light as the jackboot hollowing your throat. Um, the following poem borrows a line from a magazine um, that ran for only two issues. It was called Blast. This was um, um, in 1914, and the second issue was in 1915. It was published by the Vorticist movement in England, and um, it became a sort of a seminal text for the modernists. Uh, it's really interesting if you have time um, and are curious, you can find uh, some of the stuff online. But anyway, I picked a poem from it, uh, sorry, a line and put it in this poem. If you wanna find out which line it is, you're going to have to get the chapbook. Poem with a line from Blast One. The rooms are always crowded and there's a bomb hissing on the tip of someone's tongue. As usual, it's what's below the surface. Stupidity, animalism, dreams within dreams, endlessly vast and erotic tongues. Look, the sky is a pair of swollen eyelids. Blackbirds swoosh over trails like tiny psychedelic warplanes. Sometimes you feel incommunicably vulgar, ordinary to the point of purity. The way dirt is pure and tragedy desired only if it can clench its side muscles like hands on its belly and bring to the surface a laugh like a bomb. Bring it on, the ground parting like lips in pleasure, that flash of sparks in the center of black wings. Become that clay, that current, that short circuit. And I will read two more pieces. Um, this one is titled Mouth Gags and Shadows. You have a curious sensation that you have lived in this room many times before. The chestnuts are still beautiful and the universe is nothing but a broken sex toy. That God is also delirious and unmoored in some damned place with sirens swirling, floorboards throbbing, ropes of light wiping across the ceiling. At home, under the blinking shadows, there's scratchy whispers, and that he, too, compliant like a subtitle, mumbles to himself, help me to name this. And this is gonna be my last poem for tonight. It is composed of seven um, very brief parts. Um, so when you hear me count, I have not lost my mind. I'm just reading what, what I wrote. <laughs> this is titled Department of Dream Justice. One, I return home, sit on the pier and listen to rocks suck the sea like Frank Booth sucks on blue velvet. At dawn, my sister yanks me awake and the oval shell of the world cracks open. Boats gape like a line of polished funeral shoes. A cortege of animals gallops fluently by our house, their muscular architecture covered with lush white wool. The garden beds are dry, laundry lines bare. Sister says, come back soon. We close our eyes, wish for rain and wake in another dream. On streets of distant towns, each of us alone carries keys from our old house, looks to unlock a door that fits the key. Two, your palms close around the book of my hips, the minor tongue my hips are inscribed in. Your palms, two walls within which I sing. Three, for years, I spent nights drifting over wheat fields and vacant parking decks, and the wind whistled whistled, whistled a low narcotic tune. On the sandbank tonight, shards of bro broken glass, the river licking its shore clean like a dog nursing its wound, and the moon translucent is a soap bubble on your glistening back. My bones are hollow. There's a quick flutter of wing beats. You turn holding back the curtain of the night and you say, baby, don't you see your home? Four, 
For eternity, we are a house on fire. Five, the man with a boat on a leash. The bailor dancing naked in my living room. The man eating sea urchins in his bathtub, spray painting eels into silver bedroom whips, singing of hollow canyons. The man with two pistols against his skinny waist, the man rapping about white knuckles. My father eating goulash his mother fixed from his pet pigeons. How he sobbed in our sea splashed house after she died. The man with a horse torso digging a trench of doubt. American outage. I have a fondness for tight spaces. I tell you about each one I tucked myself into. The addict on the waterfront who always almost returned. The man who smelled of autumn, the man tearing along on his guitar like an overnight train, singing El Dolor Que Tengo Yo, El Dolor Que Tengo Yo. Six. The swallows didn't return this year, sister writes. Their nests still line the eaves of the roof. Seven. Baby, I want to be a swallow. Smallest, bluest of them, skim the surface of the sea at sunset, feed in flight. Build a cup of warm mud in the cover of someone's large house, wake up in the mornings, and while my children still sleep, feel as if it is me who keeps them safe. Thank you once again. Thank you, Andrea. And I'm going to introduce Aruni. Uh, Aruni Kashup is a writer and translator. He is the author of His Father's Disease, published in 2019, and the novel The House with a Thousand Stories from Viking Penguin Random House in 2013. He has also trans translated from Azamese and introduced celebrated Indian writer Indra Goswami's most recent work of fiction. He won the Charles Wallace India Trust Scholarship for Creative Writing to the Uni University of Edinburgh. His poetry collection, There is No Good Time for Bad News, was published in 2021 by Future Cycle Press and was a finalist for the 2018 Marsh Hawk Press Poetry Prize and the 2018 Four Way Books Levis Poetry Award in Poetry. There's No Good Time for Bad News opens in a country ravaged by prolonged political conflict. Told in the voices of survivors, the poems introduce the reader to a wide array of characters. At once vignettes and urgent pleas, these are stories as much as they are poems. The Florida Review has called Aruni one of India's rising literary voices. His short stories, poems, and essays have appeared in Catapult, Bitch Media, the Boston Review, Electric Literature, the Oxford, Oxford Anthology of Writings from Northeast, the Kenyon Review, the New York Times, the Guardian UK and others. He's an assistant professor of creative writing at the University of Georgia, Athens and can't wait for your reading. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was such a haunting, beautiful reading, Andrea and Amy, thank you so much for your generous introduction and, and this donation of your time um, in, in coordinating this event. I'm really privileged and honored to be part of this uh, event. Thank you so much to Georgia Center for the Book, the Public Library, Joe and Ali for organizing this. Um, Amy has already given a very nice introduction to my poems. So I won't speak a lot about the introductions. Um, these poems are uh, mostly set in the state of Assam in India. Uh, where I grew up in, um, but I thought that because of the insurgency that Assam has witnessed since 1979, along with many other ethnic-based nationalistic insurgencies to break away from the Indian Union, um, these poems about lived experiences of survivors uh, actually comment a lot on um, comment a lot on what it means to live under the duress of violence, and that's what I was actually trying to find the language and find, uh, find a shape and find form and find uh, expressions to, uh, so that I could describe what it really means to. And I have survived this violence. I have survived this insurgency growing up in the eighties and nineties when it was the most terrible and the insurgency kind of waned away a little bit. But I also wanted to sort of, uh, you know, intersperse these collections with other poems also about the celebration of life there. 
So I'm going to read a few um, and um, and try to give you give you a sense of what it was like to grow up there and um, and and generally life there basically. Um, my first the first poem I'm going to read um, uh, is called "The Militant's Mother: A Letter." This this poem actually interacts with Ezra Pound's "The River Merchant's Wife: A Letter," as well as another Assamese poet called Hem Borwa. He actually wrote a reply poem to "The River Merchant's Wife: A Letter," and um, and 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 I'm drawing in the same same tradition. Um, the, in the other two poems, the women write to lovers. In this poem, a, um, uh, a mother is writing to a son who has joined the banned militant organization um, in order to overthrow the Indian government. The militant's mother, a letter. I'm reading from my collection. There is no good time for bad news. After Ezra Pound and Hemborua. Moramor Baba, I have just lit the candle to write to you after a very long time. Moramor Baba, we had so, so many hopes heaped on you. You'll do well, ace the exams, go to Cotton College to study, become an Indian administrative officer, and return home with cars with red lights and sirens that would wake the village from stupor. Your father startles at night. He hasn't forgotten how the officer asked him to jump, frog jump in front of his students for raising you hasn't forgotten how he wasn't allowed to wear his dhoti. After it slipped down, he frog jumped 40 times in his underwear from one end of the field to the other until he reached the silk cotton tree. When the women moved their faces away and, their, and his students looked down at their own feet, the officer shot a dog and screamed, look, look at him, look, look, look at him. But Baba, if you come, if you come home, he would forget that pain. He would move his hands over your soft hair and say, Ahili, what will you eat? What will you eat, Baba? Baba, we, we love you. Don't doubt it. We know that you have read more books and thought about the world more than us, but I want you to see you once more. I want to know if you are eating well, if you have lost weight. Please come once again so that I can look at your face to say, Ahili. I'll serve your favorite payoh with lots of cinnamon. I'll cook your favorite fish tenga with fewer green chilies. Don't avoid visiting us, do come. Even if someone informs the officer, we want you here. Your aunt hung herself in large jackfruit tree after the officer touched her baba. Your brother left for the city after they hammered sharp pins in his fingertips because he couldn't tell them where you live. What is your next plan? Remember the silk cotton tree at the end of the village? Last month, a strong bolt of lightning burnt it down. Now it is covered by a yellow parasitic plant. The village elders say it is not a good sign. I'm worried it means it would take longer for you to come. Remember the dog that was shot dead? I have adopted her two puppies. Now seven years old, they guard her house. They don't know how their mother was killed. Only I know, only your father knows, only the village knows, but the river, the river that carries the reflection of the sky, it knows everything, including how your father who stares at the skies most of the day feels. Postscript, Baba, please come. Send news with the milkman or the fish seller like you usually do. When the fish seller brings a bunch of boreola fish and suggests cooking it with mustard, I know what he means. I promise you, when you are coming down from the Tamuli Dobha River, I will walk up to its bank to receive you as far as Ghoramora, where the horse died. The next poem is called The House with a Thousand Novels. I actually grew up in a joint family. Um, even though my father um, made a house in the city, my origins are in a joint family and I spent a lot of time every month with my father's brothers, my uncles, my aunts, my cousins. Overall, at, at any given point of time, we had about 28 to 32 people living in the same house. And in this poem, I wanted to sort of celebrate that existence, how we coexisted all the time. 
and and how every day was pretty dramatic with something or the other happening because there are always so many people and they're a guest of every person. The house with a thousand novels. This is a house L-shaped, seven hands high soil veranda with 21 novels in it. Every evening, five daughters beyond the banks who rested like bees in other houses with higher, lower or equal soil verandas and more or fewer novels lift a night black iron cauldron so that it sits on the hearth. This is a house with 21 novels forever spanning in episodic form like long yarns. In the room facing the east where the eldest son lived and Almira stood with termites backing against it. Every night along with the odious, I will take you away song with a bee spectacled inauspicious barn owl, proud, filled to the neck with a thousand books. Many of them were novels. Popular, unpopular, pulp, erotic, hidden between old, important newspaper cuttings. This is a house with eight doors, 17 windows, no ventilators. In summers, heavy with sweat and skin, snakes creep in for coconut water cold soil, coated cool with greenish cow dung, the epidermis of the seven hand high veranda. Every day, someone comes in, leaving rippling traces forever like generational earthquakes. A wailing woman leaves a story of oppression, license, rape, barrenness, adultery. A married daughter beyond the banks comes back to disrupt diaries. A worker runs away digging up hidden gold jewelry from one of these story-ridden rooms. This is a house with a thousand serialized novels floating in the heavy air. Someone shrieks every day. Someone reads the cause of the crow and expects guests, picks up a mosquito from the milk and prays that no one dies, lights a mustard oil lamp in the household's prayer room, singing pleading songs. And children carry love letters for peanuts from here, from there, leaving traces of story to be ruminated forever. With meals, at night, around winter fires, the chewing and grinding of beetle nuts while lifting the iron cauldron. This is a house with a thousand novels or more, every window or a room that mourns for event, treasures a story in it, which, which no worker can run away with, more precious than gold, buried deep enough, deeper than a spring, a well, so that it lives forever and grows like tears, hair, and serialized novels in journals, inadequate to live anymore in a wooden almira eroded by termites. One of the common things that I grew up with was constant news of bomb blasts and um, gun battles with the army and the, and, the, and the armed rebels who were trying to secede from India. Um, I, I'm, I'm the kind of person who understands why the rebels took up the arms, but I also absolutely sort of do not, do not want to endorse or romanticize the violence. I, even though I understand that uh, the violence was probably the last resort they could after years of um, negotiations and oppression. So it's a complicated history with many competing facts. But, but the biggest um, loss that we have faced is the loss of lives. And, and, and one of the most tragic incidents during the insurgency happened when a bunch of students, young kids who were celebrating Independence Day of India, uh, they were bombed at by the insurgents. Um, and this is a poem that um, I wrote from the point of view of, uh, of a person uh, who is trying to protest this. Um, in fact, actually, um, most of my poems are based on uh, interviews, testimonials, and conversations that I draw from real life. One of my, one of my mother's friends actually uh, was telling in our house, it's so easy to kill children. Why can't they kill people like us? We know we have, instead of killing children, you can kill me. That's what she was so raging and angry that she was repeatedly saying that, you know, I invite you to kill me. You know, there were, it was before Facebook, she would have probably written a status on Facebook to express that. So this, this poem is called An Invitation to Murder Me. And strangely, in, initially when I shopped around the collection, the poetry collection was also um, called An Invitation to Murder Me, but it wasn't probably a very inviting collection. So everybody rejected it. Then I changed the title and found the publisher um, uh, later on. So this collection is, this poem is called An Invitation to Murder Me. 
it is very easy to kill me. Every morning I go for a walk. I walk through the perimeter of the thousand year old rectangular pond where lovers sit or jump every evening. The Handy Girls College is always to my right. At the turn, I reach the entrance of the pond again. To go ahead, I take another turn in front of the State Museum. To reach my small apartment next to the pond, face the high court and turn right. My apartment is small. There isn't much protection either. Before sleeping, I lock the door with a Godridge lock. It is rusted, time-worn from the days of my grandmother. A single blow with a rock or a hammer would destroy it with a thud, spreading rust on the floor. You can break in. And if you, if you let me know, I will leave the door open. You don't even have to spend a bullet on me. No need to plant a time bomb. Just press a pillow on my face. I'll stop breathing. To kill me, you don't have to go all the way the upper reaches of the river. To kill me, you won't need a bomb. I hoist the national flag every day on Independence Day, though the nation gives me reason to be ashamed every day. So you should target me, not little kids, who go to Independence Day with the hope of eating sweets because they love to sing patriotic songs without knowing their meaning, because Independence Day is a holiday for them. Their little limbs, burnt skin, severed heads, as small as the dolls they carried are still on the grass. Instead of killing more babies, please come kill me. I'm an ordinary person. I use an old lock in an old apartment to protect myself from the invasion of hatred. You'll not need bombs. You will not need guns, bullets. You will just need a pillow. Uh, my last poem um, is called uh, The Man Who Loved to Plant Water Spinach. Um, this is a poem that is that very consciously uses oral folk stories in it. Um, and there are many social workers who came to my state because the state was under the, is underdeveloped and going through violence. And some of these social workers were suspected by the um, rebels as, uh, as government agents. Uh, who were spies and trying to spy on them. Um, there was a very famous social worker called Sanjay Ghosh, who was also, um, who, who, di who, was, who disappeared mysteriously and he gained a lot of popularity. So I read some of the stories of these um, social workers who were um, kidnapped or killed or they just mis disappeared mysteriously um, because of a rebel presence or because of rebel activities, allegedly. And I wrote this poem uh, as an ode to these, uh, to some of the, to these selfless social workers who actually wanted to do something for the poor community. Um, this poem is called "The Man Who Loved to Plant Water Spinach." Um, he, this, this poem is also referring to a specific river island, which is, which is or used to be the largest river island in the world, and that when that river island was constantly disintegrating. Uh, because of flood and soil erosion and the government was not doing anything. And this character in my poem went to the river island to work for the community. And one of the techniques that he popularized was to plant water spinach on the, on the river island to hold the soil uh, so that the flood couldn't take it away. The man who loved to plant water spinach, the man who told us to plant water spinach to stop the river from far away. He came from far away. He wore brown leather shoes, check shirts, torn blue jeans, and no hat in the breezy summer of the river island. The sound of bell metal and devotional songs welcomed him. Women admired the blue veins of his neck, gifted him cotton gamusas, hoping he would, pick, would pluck orchids for them. But he was interested in the river, in planting water spinach. All women who had lost their gold and husbands in floods, children orphaned by waves, and Muslims who had to throw their loved ones into the river since there was no place to bury the dead, embraced him as one of their own, started loving him more than those men who carried guns, stopped the production of local liquor, punished roadside Romeos by making them hold their ears in public or smear soot from the bottom of large cauldrons on their faces. That's what the gun-loving Morales didn't like. Why was he interested in stopping the river? Why did he plant water spinach? They didn't believe that he wasn't an Indian spy. One dawn, they tied his hands and carried him away from the shrinking island he loved so much. When they pushed him, 
he transformed into a turtle that loved porridge and paddled into the unreachable parts of the river. Until noon, they searched. In the distant land he came from, his wife fed rice to crows. For months, there was no news of him. Years later, one of those young girls who were orphaned by the river met a large, old, wise turtle with torn jeans wrapped around its body. When they catch me, chop my limbs before I'm killed, the turtle said, let the village feast on me. You plant my flippers in four different corners of the island and I will protect it by covering it in the form of water spinach. Thank you so much for listening to me patiently. Thank you so much, Aruni. That was so powerful. Um, the, our next reader is Tiana Nobile. Uh, she is a Korean American adoptee, Kundaman Fellow, and recipient of Arona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award. A finalist of the National Poetry Series and Kundaman Poetry Prize, she is the author of Cleave, published by Hub City Press in 2021. So Kathy Park Hong said of Cleave, in Tiana Nobile's wonderful cleave, the condition of the Korean American adoptee is that of a wandering orbitless moon. Nobile creates her own mythic origin story that is beautiful, melancholic, and powerful. Tiana Nobile is a bright new talent. Tiana's writing has appeared in Poetry Northwest, The New Republic, Guernica, Southern Cultures, and the Texas, Re Texas Review, among others. I especially like, she wrote, uh, The Poetics of Erasure appeared in the Chronicle, and um, it was a wonderful essay about erasure poetry. Uh, Tiana received her BA from Sarah Lawrence College, her MAT in Elementary and Special Education from the University of New Orleans, and an MFA in Poetry from Warren Wilson College. She lives in New Orleans, Louisiana. And, oh, here's her book, and it's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Amy, for that lovely introduction. And thank you to the Georgia Center for the book for inviting me to read and to Andrea and Aruni for sharing your beautiful work. I was unfamiliar with both of y'all's poems before tonight and it was so lovely to hear you both read tonight. So thank you. Um, I'm actually going to read a long poem that was just published this weekend by Southern Cultures Magazine, which is a journal based out of UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I'm, a few years ago, I went through a pretty difficult divorce, and in my attempt to make sense of my grief, I turned to the alphabet, and the result was a long poem, Abecedarian, that I wrote over the course of two or three years, and I thought, since it just came out, that it would be a great um, opportunity to share it with you all. Uh, I also wanted to read it because it features uh, lots of nods to life in the South, so it felt appropriate. Um, I'm going to put the link in the chat in case you want to follow along for accessibility purposes. And then also because there's some really beautiful illustrations by an artist named Julian Alexander that accompany the piece. So if you want to check those out or check it out later if you want to just listen now. Um, and the poem is written in sections, so I'm just going to pause briefly between each section. A burning. After the fire went out, we kept burning. I confused the embers in your hair for stardust, but who was I then to know the log was lit from the inside, flush with its own grief? I buried myself in the compost heap. Before the flood swept the lemons away, there was a garden. How temperamental the tomatoes were to any change in the weather. We did best with herbs rosemary, basil, chives. While chopping, the cutting board would turn green, the smell of fresh earth lingering on the pads of my fingers. Carefully, I close the door. The house is thick with echoes. If I hold my breath, perhaps my lungs will collapse, or perhaps the fingers of my ribs will round like a fist collecting its coin. Quietly, I turn the lock, but the latch rejects silence, its metal groan reverberating through the bones of the walls. Do you ever wonder about the light on the river, how it danced beneath the bend in our boat? How do you remember, with eyes clenched, pupils pulled back in the darkness of your skull? Or are they open, unblinking, full of water? Even snails seek shelter from the flood, 
As the streets fill with water, a horde flees in haphazard clusters, their wet trails glistening beneath the porch light. I too make this journey toward the light. I carry my conch on my back, leave traces of cigarette ash in my wake. I bury myself in the creases of the house until I am one with the wood. I curl my body around my body into a pulpy spiral until I can feel my heart beating inside my throat. Forget about the blood on the light switches, the pillowcases. Forget about the muffled shuffle of footsteps on the carpet. Forget the way a person's eyes glaze over after the third glass of whiskey. The corner of their lips upturned, their shoulders poised for a fight. Forgetting scratches at the inside of my mouth, my tongue torn open by its sharp nail. I gargle salt water, wash all the sheets, burn sage. Growing side by side, eventually one tree will overshadow the other, its branches extending wide. The taller tree stretches out horizontally, stealing the other's sunlight. How do I stretch without casting a shadow? I try to make myself small until I don't. I try to avoid the sun until I don't. I imagine a life without brine, without the smell of freshly cut lumber, the wood dust sticking to your skin like glitter, your hair wet thick with sun and smoke. I imagine not knowing the barb of a hook, a life without fish scales the size of my thumbnail sticking to the bottom of my foot. In this bed whirls the smell of campfires and smoked meat. Here, I reach out my fingers and find your cloudy coattails. I imagine a face I wish I never saw turn to grimace and dagger. A face freckled with tenderness and ache. Joy is butter melting in the pan. The silk of fresh pasta dissolving on the tongue. Sucking the meat from between the jagged bones of a turkey's neck. Licking seasoning off fingertips during a crawfish boil. The umami of an all day gumbo, savory on the tongue. Keep these memories close. I can still smell the cooking oil as it popped in the cast iron after a day paddling around the lake, tying fishing line to cypress knees and peeling off catfish skins. My body was sticky with day old sweat as the fish sizzled in the pan and you lurched through the woods searching for dry leaves and sticks for kindling. Let us not forget, before the house burned down, there was a house. Later, I will wonder not what I did wrong, but what I did right. The night swells and blooms around me, blue as a bruise. Miles away, Nikita's voice on the phone reaches towards me, mine, like a blossoming flower. We deserve a love that liberates, she says, and the bars begin to crumble. Together we map a soft and tender future. I build a house in the curly nest of her hair. Now spring has ended and I'm all out of questions. The zucchini plants flowered again, but did not produce any fruit. I spent the month of June biting the skin off the inside of my lip until it was raw as tender meat. Now my cheeks are dry and the summer heat descends like a stage curtain. On a night in early October, in the bed of a new lover, I can hear the moan of the steamboat drift through paper thin walls. I think about the river, only a few blocks away, its mouth wide and gaping open as it carries the north's rain, hands full of silt into the gulf. Pretend none of it happened. I am 25 and scarless. I straighten the curls out of my hair and tear at my cuticles in moments of stillness. Years later, I will pull the curtains from my eyes. The sun will be bright and I will not yield. Questions I never ask. 
How many kisses will untie a knotted mouth? What does it take to repair the body after a flood? Rising in crescendo, the flames squeal as they devour the last scraps of wood, flashes of red and white and green. Slowly, the world settles back to a familiar hue. The yellow yawn of morning slips under the covers and becomes a gentle orange promise again. Even the garden soil is somehow browner as a squirm of compost worms pinks through the dirt. I grow kale and tomatoes from seed. I watch them sprout and sway as if waving hello. The sweet pleasure of a new mouth, its soft surprise, how easily the silk of desire slips back on the skin. I remember how to be tender. A man lifts my chin and kisses me with open eyes. Unravel this. The way the body insists on breath, even underwater. The crispness of that first unfettered sigh. Very soon, it will be a faraway memory. It's spring again and the world is closing in. Home becomes a haven. Ross and I repaint all the walls. We buy a hammock and curl around each other's bodies like cucumber tendrils. We contemplate what to do with the tree, its limbs scattered in the yard. Friends take what's left of the lumber to lacquer the logs and make small tables. We burn the rest. When the fire went out, I mourned the tree before sweeping its ashes into a hole. At night, the chickens roost in its freshly tilled soil. Expect nothing less. Expect better. Wait for the one who will gather you like petals and lay you gently on the bed. The one with delicate hands who tends to the house plants like children cooing into their soft green ears. You plant a new, tre a new tree in the yard, a satsuma. It will be years before you harvest its first fruit, but you are patient, aren't you? You prune its leaves as you wait. Zooming above, the migratory birds arrive in clusters, marking the beginning of summer as they make their way back north. The dill I planted reaches upward in tiny spindly arms, their bristly heads swaying in the breeze, while the first sparks of red sprout from the tomato vine. We pop the tiny bulbs straight in our mouths the sweet juice bursting on our tongues. Thank you. Thank you, Tiana. Beautiful reading. So I just asked uh, the, I guess all the, the panelists can come back on. Um, I asked the audience if there are any questions it looks like we don't have any questions yet. Um, so I was going to ask a few questions, although the thunderstorm is vying for, <laughs> for attention here <laughs> a little bit. Um, so I was going to ask you, Aruni, about you're a poet and a fiction writer. Uh, you've writ written novels and poetry. And if you could talk a little bit about how they influence each other. So how does uh, poetry writing influence fiction and vice versa. Thank you for that question, Amy. Um, I think I'm at heart a fiction writer and a storyteller. I think poems, essays, um, a poet, uh, novels, short stories, novellas, I have written in all these genres, they're all actually different ways of telling a story. And I believe in the, you know, this is something very basic probably for all of us, but I believe in the absolute power of stories to move us to move um, human beings, to move society, to bring change. Uh, every time one of my students come up with a question, uh, why should I read literature? How is it going to help change the society? I start with the, with the example of Grapes of Wrath, which led to change in, in an American labor laws <laughs> because of the controversy and discussion around it, or, or the work of Nadine Gordimer, or the work of other inspiring writers that I have known in India who 
whose work, you know, whose work because of their empathy, because of their vision, changed society. And poetry has always played a major role in social change in, 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 in on the streets. It's poetry that people actually uh, chant uh, on the streets. Um, it's a poetic story that's going to move people to uh, bring change and be on the streets and inspire them. We, we hear heartbreaking stories or inspiring stories in distant lands, and we decide that we must support this cause even though we haven't met any of the people. So I think that they are, they are indispensable. They are all, only different mediums of, of storytelling. So actually also a lot of these poems uh, that I wrote here, almost all of them, they are, each of them are, uh, they are a story or they are borrowing heavily from oral stories, uh, folk stories um, from my indigenous culture. Um, and, 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 and that's because a lot of these stories were actually initially, I excavated these stories while I was researching for my first novel in 2009, 2010, talking to rural communities, how they survived the insurgency, what kind of experiences they had. And what I really found was interesting was that um, all these people had inspiring survivalist stories and within these stories were the stories of people who did not survive as well. So they were very inclusive in their nature, very inspiring in their nature. Even, even the activist, social activist, after he, he, he metaphorically dies, he continues to protect the village in the form of water spinach that, that are actually um, a transformation of his flippers. So, so these survivalist stories were deeply inspiring to me, but they didn't make it to the novel eventually. So they kept triggering me, they kept sort of, you know, sort of prodding me in a, in a, in a good way. And I kept writing these poems over 10 years. So I think that's a great question and a beautiful question. And I think they are actually essentially stories and they are stories about people who made it, people who inspire, people who live to tell, tell the tale. And I think it's very important for me as a writer of color from an indigenous community, from a marginalized community to tell these stories because I think in the global north, what we see is a lot of um, non-survivalist stories, a lot of pity stories that are published by the corporate publishing industry. And I think in the global, Global South, uh, the Global South is sort of often uh, looked at, uh, you know, with with a lot of uh, pity and and uh, uh, and sympathy, or you know, in, instead of instead of empathy. So I think it's very important to tell the stories of these people who survived because they are going to tell the stories on their own terms, in their own voice, as you can see. So thank you so much for asking me the question. Yeah, thanks for that wonderful answer. Um, if you. Andrea and Tiana, if you want to join in or respond in any way, but I, I loved your answer. So, um, Tiana, I, I mentioned the Poetics of Erasure, your, your essay, and I, I can see from your book that you have a couple of erasure poems and you also use found, their found poems as well, some of them. And so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the importance of erasure and found poems to, to poetry. How is it important for your work and maybe how is it important for poetry in general? Sure, yeah, I've, I've been a student of erasure for a really long time. Um, and I think in particular, what, what it, about erasure that fascinates me is the power of subversion. In particular, for me, like as in a transracial, transnational adoptee, there's so many documents associated with my existence here in the United States. And I found it so striking that as I was kind of working through those documents, how bereft of emotion or feeling or um, they were when they're literally dealing with the transaction of, of a living human child. So I think by through erasure and, and incorporating that text in my poems, I was finally able to to kind of interrogate the, those documents directly um, and then um, point a finger to the fa uh, how cold and sterile it was and then um, elevate the experience, my experience uh, like, you know, of ha having feelings being a human person and the complicated nature of my adoption. I think erasure, erasure in particular I think is, so, is super compelling because it points to so many layers, right? There's, there's the original text there's what's missing from the original text. And then there's the elevation of the newly constructed narrative. So like in, in that essay that you, you mentioned, like Steve Kent Reddy does this phenomenal project in, in Voyager where he borrows, or he's erasing um, three different times from this, uh, the, oh, what's it called? Um, I forget the name, the title, but it was written by Kurt Waldheim. It's his memoir and he was the former a former um, UN security general and 
and was also a former SS officer, but that is not mentioned at all in his memoir. And yet somehow by enacting this erasure on the actual memoir already like elevates this kind of mysterious haunting aspect of this man, right? That he didn't even include, but he points to it through an erasure. And I just think it's so brilliant to be able to kind of, kind of bring attention to the what's not being said. And I think similarly in my own work with my own documentation to point to what's missing through, through erasure I find really, yeah, really powerful. Thanks, yeah, another wonderful answer, you guys. You are all writing such uh, important poems right now. Um, so uh, Andrea, my question to you is, um, uh, I know that your your book was published under the Surrealist Acme Surreal, Surrealism series. Um, so how has Surrealism influenced your work and how do you see your work as surreal? Cool, thank you. Um, I was not intentionally writing poems that would embrace the Surrealist tradition. Um, it was something that was pointed out to me by the editor of Willow Springs Magazine when they invited me to submit, uh, to put together a chapbook and submit to them for consideration. And, and it was an interesting moment because I, I, I think I asked some people, I think I asked you as well, like this, I had never thought of myself as a surrealist poem, poet, but I see that there are surrealist elements in it, in the, some of this writing. Um, now, um, when I was, when I first discovered poetry, like I was young, too young to actually realize, oh, I'm discovering poetry. But I was in my, I think, I think I was about 12, 13, something like that. And I came across, I think it was my local librarian gave me um, Charles Baudelaire. And I absolutely fell in love with every line. I have no idea whose translation I read, but I fell in love with it so hard. Uh, and it just kind of ended up marking sort of like a sort of aesthetics in me early on, you know? And I think it was a similar aesthetics that I was looking for in music and in visual arts and so on and so forth. But of course, when I was writing these poems, I wasn't thinking about Baudelaire. What I was thinking about really was that my first collection, Small Crimes, uh, was filled with a lot of poems that dealt with um, war, the solution of a country, just kind of heavy traumatic stuff. And a lot of those poems are narrative. And I felt a little bit like I needed a change and I needed a sort of like release from what is perceived as logic. And I also felt like to continue writing only narrative poems about some of these events, um, just doesn't seem authentic because there's so much that happens underneath the surface. So it's kind of like when you look at the sea or a lake or whatever, all we see is the surface. And I can write a story about what happens at the surface, but really there's a whole lot more going on underneath. And that's what I think people are like and what life experience is like. So sometimes it's just, uh, it seems more, um, how would I say, I, I feel like I'm, uh, I live with more integrity or write with more integrity if I allow that subconscious stuff to, you know, if I give it space. Uh, the other thing that I liked about it is it seemed to me initially like it was a playful thing to do. Like, oh, okay, let's, let's just mess around with language a little bit more. And it is to an extent, but then you have to kind of like, if I let go of logic and reason, uh, what we consider, then I have to figure out the logic of a poem, right? Um, but that's kind of basically how I got to it, um, more or less. And these dream, the, the, the sequence in this book, it kind of, the reason why I created these poems that sort of weave in and out of the dream world was because I kind of kept thinking about how um, we don't do justice to reality. <laughs> if we only report on things that are measurable, right? And honestly, sometimes reality seems so surreal. It just makes no sense. There is no logic or reason behind it. So it just seems the right thing to allow what is personal, what, it, what we keep uh, inside or, or what's illogical, what belongs to the subconscious 
uh, to allow it out. All right, again, a beautiful answer. So um, I don't know if Joe is still, we, we got the message that his power is out. So is Joe still here? Oh, okay. I am back, yes, yes, yes. Okay, all right, well, thank you. I don't see any other questions, but you know, what a, what a great answer to all those questions, thank you. There are some questions in the uh, chat box. There are, yeah, there are a couple that popped up in the Q&A, so we can take care of those um, real quick as well. So okay. Kimberly asked the first question, um, and it goes to all the poets, and she asks, how do you overcome the feelings that may come up, like embarrassment or shame when writing about something very personal or something that may seem unpretty, such as a rotting uterus? If anyone would like to take a stab at that one. I'm happy to go. Um, I really write, write a lot of poems about queer desire and about dating and using dating apps because, um, yeah, so um, I use them a lot when I was uh, many years ago, you know, when they started becoming popular. And I, it was, it was awkward, but I thought that I was also processing my own uh, attitudes towards them. And I'm also, pro I was also processing the, my own um, feelings about them, uh, about the personal events, both traumatic as well as happy, as well as um, uh, serendipitous or surreptitious, you know, um, things that I would not talk about openly. It gave me a very wonderful window. Um, and uh, and I think, I think um, poetry was a way of making sense of what I really think about them. And I realized that and I realized that the more I write about it, the more I make myself vulnerable, the more, uh, uh, the stronger I am, I'm becoming in accept, actually accepting them all, all as part of myself and, and love myself. Andrea, Tiana, do you have anything to follow up about that? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to say this. I think I'm shameless. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I, th I don't know. I think people have different comfort levels with different things. Um, uh, two things come to mind. One is a friend of mine uh, said once that unless you're risking uh, embarrassment in a poem, you're just not, you're, you're, you're probably just writing a boring piece. You got to risk something. Uh, might as well risk embarrassment. I'd rather embarrass myself than, well, I have embarrassed other people as well, but I, I, I don't disclose who they are. <laughs> uh, the other thing that comes to mind is that I think that poetry, um, generally speaking, this is the case for me, and this is the case for a lot of people that I read, and at least poets that, or writers in general who I gravitate to, tend to be people who see beauty in things that are not conventionally beautiful or pretty or appealing. Um, and I think that that's, that's to me like something that seems like, oh, that person is alive. They're present, they notice the world. They see that tiny spark of, of beauty and light and life where you know most people would just walk by it and never even pay attention. So, and, and I think we kind of owe it to life because a lot of it is not, necessarily pretty, conventionally pretty. Yeah, I'll, I'll just echo what Rini said about the poem being a space to kind of under, to find understanding or to like work through a process of understanding. Um, particularly with the poem that I, the long poem that I read, you know, I think it was a very chaotic time for me. And just by grounding myself in the alphabet and working through those letters really helped me to like come to terms with what it, like how I was feeling, what, what, um, what I was grieving and like what healing looks like. And I think, I think also I like part, I think part of the job of being a poet is being vulnerable. Um, and by, and it doesn't always have to be beautiful. I mean, I think like devastation, I guess also can be beautiful or, or it's just can be compelling or, but it's like diving into those, those places that hurt and then finding connection with, with other people, I think that's really, that can be the, the beautiful part. Excellent, thank you all. 
Well, we have just a few more um, real quick. We have a, one from a listener named Fred who says, I recognized and appreciated the art and the work in all of the poems. Can each of you explain what would be the best mindset, if any, for the reader or listener to navigate the poem's meaning? I can take a jab at that if uh, others are thinking. Very quick, uh, I, I think, um, I, th I don't think my poems are my poems after they are out and published uh, because I think that's a, that's a thought process that comes from indigeneity, folk culture, which is very central to my imagination. When somebody tells me a story or somebody sings me a song, um, when I relate, when I make sense of it, I make it my own and give it a new meaning and a shape and a structure. Sure. That's very much central in my culture. So for me, um, poetry is like that, stories are like that. Um, and I think that once it is out in the book format, I don't think I have control over how people are going to read it. And, and I don't want to also take responsibility for that because that's not, I'll never be able to write if I take responsibility for anybody's, how they feel about my poems. So I think everybody should approach it with love, care and caution and respect uh, and, 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 process it the way they, they want to be. I think every poem speaks to every person in a new way. And that is why I think the beauty of a poem is that, especially poetry, is that it has so many meanings. Uh, every reader, it is a new poem. Andrea, Tiana, anything to add to that? Although that was a fantastic answer. Just gonna let you know, so wonderful. Uh, yeah, I agree with Arvini. I think, you know, there's what we bring to the creation of the poems in the book, but then once it's in somebody else's hands, it's really like their journey to, to, to experience it and explore it. And um, I know for me, when I have a new book of poetry, at least I like, I want to make sure I'm well rested and hydrated and like I have a quiet space, you know, so I, cause I, so I can totally like immerse myself in the book, um, especially particularly with poetry. I know like if I'm tired or distracted it's not it's going to be really difficult so I think that just to make it like figuring out for you like what's the, re the right kind of mood and space to to sit with with it um I'll just add by the way I love these answers um and I, I think that Aruni just hit the nail on the head uh with it um the only thing that I would also maybe add is that I think it is important not to overthink a poem and but to actually um, enjoy it if there is anything to enjoy of course if it is enjoyable and to allow the poem um, to move you um, I think it's also interesting when uh, when we think about uh, let's say influential poets who have been translated in many languages and how many people they have impacted in different ways. Maybe it's easier to think about it in terms of music, like how you can have a, a popular song and how people who listen to it will, it, it will mark a particular stage in their life, a particular point, it's going to become a memory piece. So exactly like Aruni was saying, the audience makes the other half of the experience. Um, that was really well put, thanks. Excellent. So our final question of the night, um, and that is, would you say that most of your poetry is written from a place of pain or triggers as opposed to happy places? I'll take a quick stab at this one. Um, I, I don't think it's either uh, because if I if I, first of all, if I'm feeling really good, I'm not, I'm not writing. <laughs> I'm going to be, you know, doing something that's fun. Uh, I, if I'm feeling hurt, I am most likely going to pick up a book and get lost in it. I'm not going to write. And if I do write, it's probably not going to be the best piece of writing. But the, I think that for me, the piece, the state of mind that I catch myself most often being in, or the emotional state is one of observation. It's a kind of a weird 
sense of detachment, but also intense focus on whatever it is that I'm trying to write about. Uh, so I can't say, and then for that detachment to take place, I can't be, um, I can't be emotionally um, fully into it, if that makes sense. May I? Um, I would say that I write from a place mostly of delight and happiness, um, but this happiness and delight is also tinged with all the trauma, pain, sadness that has made me who I am. Uh, and actually, I know the value of delight so well because I have also experienced pain so deeply. And that's, that's a very um, enabling space to me. I don't want to just be a happy person. Uh, all the time. I would be a cartoon character probably then. But I'm who I am because I have gone through so much, so much experience. And actually that's what is so valuable about uh, us as human beings. We do not, we will not be able to value happiness if we can't get any pain actually. I love that, this writing from a place of delight. I I think, yeah, I think like we do it because we write because we love it even and it's sometimes it's really hard. So I, I think for me, like when I when I'm super activated, whether it be from a place of extreme joy or extreme sadness, I'm not writing. Like I like I said before, like I'm, I'm often writing like it as a reflective way to process and understand a feeling from previously. So I'm not writing when I'm in that moment. And I think whether whatever emotion it may be, um, that comes later. And a, a, po a mentor of mine at one point, because I was, what made me think of something that Andrea said, I remember like kind of feeling really down on myself because I wasn't writing as much as I thought. And she said, you're always writing because you're looking out the window or you're walking down the street or you're hearing noise, at, like a, a, new, a new song or, you know, you pricked your finger. Like, I think that's, we feel so deeply every moment, whether it just be observational or personal. And I think all of that feeds the work. Um, later. Yeah, those are such beautiful answers and I'm really sorry but I'm going to just add one little thing uh, and I, I think that literary imagination and literature are these are spaces where we can escape these binary empirical legally provable um, ideas of reality and that's why we embrace this actually and that's the most empowering thing about one of the most empowering thing about literary imagination and literature um, and I'm writing poetry which are fictional in nature, but based in reality of different kinds of people, because I want to escape this binary and find something that is the literary truth or the emotional truth, as Adichie, Chimamanda Adichie Adichie would like to say, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the lived experience. We cannot do that if we understand reality in this very limiting and binary ways of, of approaching our world. So we have to let go of these and dive into literature and, and, and see that literature is a result of all of these things and not just once. And I think in the current climate, we really try to simplify things because it enables us to explain things in 140 characters, but actually that's not how literary literature works. It, it's much more complex. It is not limited to a Twitter thread or a, a, a long social media post. It is so much more deeper. Wow, excellent. Thank you all so very much. Those were some amazing questions from our attendees tonight and absolutely deep and profound answers. Um, folks are for, we're quoting it over in the chat. Um, so I, I think they, you know, will continue to quote them um, hopefully in future writing as well. So once again, thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, Andrea, Aruni, and Tiana. Thank you, Amy Pence, for being our wonderful guest host this evening. We hope to have many, many more of those in the future, and we hope to have you back to do that as well. We hope that all of you will take advantage and order the books on the links provided. Um, don't forget, love a poet, buy poetry. Thank you all so much again for joining us this evening. Have a wonderful night, and we will see you again very, very soon. <laughs>